If you have your Bibles, uh, turn, turn over with me. You can turn there first to, uh, let's say, Mark chapter 6. And you can just get to Mark chapter 6 and just hang out there a little bit. We'll get in there in a minute. Uh, Mark, the sixth chapter. And let, me, let me just set this up like this. Um, er, early in 2020, I became aware that there was a, a shift taking place in how the church community in large was dealing with social issues. Uh, up until the past couple of years, one thing that you can generally count on was how believers by and large kind of stuck together when it came to Christian values that were challenged. Um, we may have differed from each other on the, on the style of how we do church, but for the most part, when it came to Christian values, we really stuck together as a church community at large. But as cancel culture began to increase, the value bond between believers began to decrease. And, well, combined with the fact that you bring into the picture uh, the incredible power and influence of social media. And now let me introduce you to the most condemning, critical, and canceling culture in the history of our nation. So much so that even the people, many of them who we are close to, one, one person can, can make one comment on social media that we don't agree with or don't like, and then all of a sudden we have all this toxic venom coming out. To the point where one person says, oh, I can't even go to church with you anymore. Can't even worship in the same place with you anymore. Uh, but as followers of Jesus, how many know you and I are called to live a different lifestyle? We cannot blend in with the culture around us by living critical, condemning, offensive, and canceling lives. Amen. Amen. And one of the primary values that will help shape us into becoming more like Jesus culture rather than cancel culture is this biblical value called honor. Uh, the Apostle Paul actually deals with this in Romans chapter 12. I, I put it up on the screen because it's, I, I want to read you the message translation of verse number 2. He just simply says it like this, don't become so well adjusted to your culture. Now he's talking about your outside culture around you, that you fit into it without even thinking. Pretty clear, isn't it? Okay, now, now you go down a little bit further in, in verse number 10, and it's not like he changes the subject. It's the same topic. And he says it like this in verse number 10, honor one another above yourselves. So it's not like the Apostle Paul got distracted. He's talking the same language. He's saying on one hand, he says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. And, and I, I believe the Apostle Paul anticipated what we were, our next question. And that question is, well, how are you supposed to do that, Paul? And I think the Apostle Paul would have said something like, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let me model it for you. Honor one another above yourselves. Now, let me clarify that it's not just the people you like. Uh, it's not just the ones who are in your inner circle. Uh, it's not just those who agree with you. I'm going to add this caveat to it politically. It's not just the ones who wear the same uh, sport team logo on their ball cap that you do. No, everyone. Everyone. Nowhere in that instruction does it say anything about whether or not that person deserves honor. God doesn't put any conditions on it. He just says to do it. Now, I'm in Mark chapter 6. It's going to be our primary text for the day. Um, but let me set Mark chapter 6 up for you because when, by the time we get into Mark chapter 6, Jesus had just finished performing these amazing miracles. And in fact, that's what he was doing. He was hopping from village to village, from town to da town, leaving his mark, performing miracles, delivering people from all kinds of diseases, whatever, 
teaching, preaching, setting people free, basically going from town to town, making a mark that cannot be erased. Enter Mark chapter 6. Beginning in verse number 1, you got the setting. It says it like this. Now, I have it in this translation, so you can follow along anyway. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him, they were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Like, this guy's amazing. Verse 3, then they scoffed. Did you see the shift? Then they scoffed. He, he's just a carpenter. Isn't, it, isn't this just Mary's son? Isn't he just the brother of James? Like, who does he think he is? I'm telling you, this, this is a picture right here. This scene depicts our culture today so vividly. Like, I like it, I like it, I like it, I like it, I like it. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Like, you can hit the game-winning home run tonight and be a hero and strike out in the bottom of the ninth tomorrow night and be a chump. Right? In 20, less than 24 hours. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Right? And so it goes on to say they were, watch this, deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Sound familiar? Yeah. These days people are on the hunt to be offended. I mean, have you noticed that? People are actually looking for an opportunity to be offended. Like I got this chip on my shoulder, I dare you to come try and knock it off. Can I just say something this morning? If you are looking for an opportunity to be offended, you will always find what you are looking for. Come on, somebody. So, so the scene in Mark chapter 6 has become extremely toxic. And so Jesus responds, and he says, here's verse 4, a prophet is, say it with me, honored everywhere, say it with me, except in his own hometown and amongst his relatives and his own family. Isn't that like that so often, though? Isn't it really like, don't, don't we, come on, don't, don't look at me so holy. I know this is you too. Don't we, all, don't we have so much more tolerance for, for the people who we have casual relationships with, acquaintances, neighbors, you know, than we do our own family? When it comes to our own family, maybe our, maybe our spouse, our kids, our, our tolerance level is so low, and yet neighbors or strangers, we have such high tolerance for. Let, 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 me, let me describe it like this. We, 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 I think it's because we set levels of, of expectancy. For example, um, our, our level of expectancy on how people perform in our lives, let's say our friends, our inner circle, maybe it's this high, right? Here, here's the level of expectancy that we have towards them. Uh, maybe, um, maybe our family members, our kids, our our siblings, parents, whatever, maybe our expectation of them is, is this high, okay? And, and perhaps our spouses, I would, I would assume that our spouses, that level of expectancy is like right up here, right? For, for what we expect them to perform towards our lives. Our pastors, I mean, it's like, <laughs> right? So now watch this, watch this. When, when, you, when you set a level of expectancy, here's how that works. If, if, if the level of expectancy you have towards one of your family members is this high, if they only perform this high, they have offended you this much. Conversely, those who your expectancy level is only this high, maybe the neighbor down the street, if they do something for you that's this high, they have actually blessed you by this much. So you can have a level of expectancy with different people, and some people will bless you by this much, and some people will offend you by this much. And, and they've done the same exact thing. Uh, I, I can show you this. I actually heard uh, this testimony of this person. It was a guy talking about how and I, I had to laugh because this actually, we actually had a car that did this. Uh, so, so what would happen is he would, he would click, use the clicker, the remote, to open his car door. And, and then that would open the driver's door, right? But then, but then you would have to click it the second time to open the passenger door. 
But there was a defect in this particular car that he had where when you clicked it the second time, you would hear a click, but it would take about a, a second and a half or two seconds to actually unlock the door. But his wife, who was standing on the, on the passenger side, as soon as she heard the click, she would try to open the door, and it would cancel out the click. How many know what I'm talking about? Come on. Okay. And so he would be like, darling, wait a minute. Click, 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 <laughs> click, <laughs> And it would frustrate him so much. He said, I got so frustrated. He'd be like, step away from the vehicle. Like, wait, wait, right? And so finally they get in the car and they have all this tension in the car. You ever get in the car with your spouse and there's tension? Never, right? Nobody in here, right? You never get in the car and your kids, uh, you, just, you, just, you just think about how much you just want to bless them so much right? All the time, right? You, there's never any tension when, when you're on your, and, and never when you're on your way to church. How many of you I'm talking about? You never have tension on the way to church. Uh, so he gets in the car and there's all this tension and there's silence for a while because she knows he's upset because it happens every time. And he's just driving there going, can't she get that? Why can't she get it? It's just two seconds, right? And then he, he says it like this. He says, I, I don't know if it was the spirit of God talking to me, or if it was just my own guilty conscience or maybe both. He said, but here's what I heard in my spirit. How about you walk around to her side of the car and open the door for her? Like you used to when you were dating. So he thought about that for a little while and, and, and he got a new car. But anyway, <laughs> but you guys know what I'm talking about, right? So, so this makes sense, right? Because God has called us to live Help me out a different way. Right. Now watch this, guys. Honor is about what you decide, not about what they deserve. Okay. I can say it a different way, okay? We, we have in our relationships, whether, whether it is personal or professional, there is a temptation for us to think to ourselves, I would honor them more if they were more honorable. Come on, how many of you ever thought that? In other words, I would honor them if they were more honorable. Here's what I would say to that. Neither were you. Ne ne neither were you. Yet Christ, who is completely honorable, saw value in us anyway and died for us. Paul, Paul models this in Romans chapter 5, verse 7. He says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. Notice he's not even clear on that. He's like, I don't even know if that'll work, but I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Verse, verse 8, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's the righteous for the unrighteous, the honorable for the dishonorable. I could say it a better way. God has this unique ability to see us both in our depravity and our dignity at the same time. And I want you to know that's, that's to our benefit. Like, he sees what you did last week because he's watching but at the same time, he, he's also able to see your dignity and the purpose and the potential that he's put down on the inside of you. And I believe, church, that, that God is, is, is asking the church community to learn that same, that same value. It's called honor. It, it, it's called honor. Uh, it's, it's P, first Peter talks about this in his epistle in 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, let me set this up for you because... Uh, if you ever come across anything in the Bible that doesn't line up with your way of thinking, <laughs> let me help you out. Change your way of thinking. Okay, this is one of those passages for me. Okay. What, what, what we're about to see is, is, is a passage that I, I, had to, I actually had to apply faith towards it because I thought for sure uh, this could not be in the Bible. Like I actually, I actually studied every translation I could find as a loophole opportunity to get me out of doing this. 
Have I got your attention yet? Watch it. He says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. Didn't even say for their sake. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Notice he didn't say every Christian authority. Whether to the emperor as to the supreme authority or to, the, to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to con- commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk on Facebook. And I actually, I actually studied that in the Greek. It literally says on Facebook. Verse 16, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's servants. Show proper respect to, say it with me, everyone. Now, Peter's about to model what that looks like. Number one, love the family of believers. Number two, fear God. Number three, honor the emperor. Well, but Pastor Doug... He, he can't, he doesn't know our governor. He, he doesn't know our, the leaders of our nation. That doesn't make sense. Certainly you cannot be talking. Do you know what they said? Do you know what they did? Do you know what they're acting like? Like Pastor Doug, like, like the, the leader of our state, whatever, he, the, the leaders of our nation, they're, they're, not, they're not moving towards God. They're godless moving away from God at rapid speeds. Certainly not not these people. Yet, Peter says, honor him, honor the emperor. I, 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 want, I want to just share this with you for a moment because you might not know that when Peter wrote this epistle, the emperor of his time was, was a man by the name of Nero. Who, if you study it, is probably one of the most evil men to ever walk the planet. Particularly towards Christian, early Christian church believers. You, you stu- it's in history. He, he would take families of believers, arrest them, gather them together, and, and, and in front of family members, he would have them killed for sport because he enjoyed you know, the, the, the splashing of their blood. This was an evil, evil man. He was a godless man. And yet, Peter says, honor the emperor. Pastor Doug, why? Doesn't, isn't God concerned about what some of these people are doing today? Certainly he is. Yes, he is. He, he sees what they're doing. I would go one step further to say that God dislikes what they're doing even more than we could ever imagine disliking it. But he's, then why? But he's trying, because he's trying to build up in us a lifestyle of honor. Um, And I know that doesn't set well with some of you. I can just feel the tension coming off of you. I'm going to give you two simple points and then we're going to be done today. Number one, here it is, honor Honoring benefits me more than those I honor. Honoring benefits me more than those I honor. Honor. And in contrast, listen, dishonoring hurts me more than those I dishonor. So now here's the rest of, of, of Mark chapter 6 that we didn't talk about, okay? Jesus, he, he goes on to say, he says in verse number 4, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, amongst his own relatives, and his own home. We reread that part. Here's the part we didn't read. Verse 5, he could not do any miracles there. Notice he didn't say he would not. He said he could not. It didn't say he would not. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and, and, and heal him. This is the same person who calmed the waters, the same person who cast out demons, raised the dead, fed, fed multiple people with just a, a box lunch, right? Walked on water, turned water into wine. Jesus, this is Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, and yet he could not do miracles there. Could it be that we are limiting what God wants to do in our lives because of our own negative attitude towards other people? How many, I wonder how many of our prayers have been hindered 
because we have been on a Facebook rampage of dishonor. It's getting quiet in here today. What would happen if the church world collectively would pray for our leaders as much as we chop them down? You, you say, Pastor D Doug, but look what they did. Doesn't matter. Did you hear what they said? Doesn't matter. Your Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. And he turns it whichever way he chooses. Now, lest you think that I am promoting an, an apathetic posture towards what's wrong, I remind you what Edmund Burke was famous for quoting. He said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. And I believe that. But I also believe that we are called to live a different way. And never did God say that standing in the gap and making up the hedge should be done outside of honor. Now, I have to admit, I have done it. So it's not like me standing up here looking down on all, oh, I am physically looking down on all of you, but it's not like I'm posturing that, like, like I got this down, you don't. I, I've done it. I've done it recently. Someone, someone sent me a, a meme, a funny meme, and it was funny. I have to admit, it was funny. It was about one of our leaders. And I, I forwarded it on to a few people, that I, some of my friends. And it was funny. I'm sure they probably got a laugh out of it also. But can I tell you something? It was, it was elevating that person's depravity, not their dignity. And the Spirit of God quickened me about it. And I, I actually heard the Spirit of God say in my devotion time, if you would spend as much time praying for that person as you do finding ways to make fun of them, I might be able to do something in the world today. And so I was quickened over it. And I, I'm not saying I'm perfect still yet, but I mean, we need to be starting thinking about this. Here's point number two. And we're gonna be closed here in a minute. The more I value something, the more value I get from it. Here's your assignment today. So we got a little homework today, okay? I, I want you to look for every way you can to honor someone. And if you don't know how to do that, start in your own home. Find ways to build up that other person. Talk nicely to them. Start saying things that promote them. Brag on them. Honor them. You say, well, do it with your spouse. You say, well, my spouse doesn't do that to me. Well, well guess what? That's your, 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 this is going to work out for you. Let me tell you why. It's because we're going we're to model this, in this from the same verse that we started out this message with today. It's in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, but it's in a different translation. Here's how it says it. Love one another with brotherly affection. I want you to say, everybody say the last line with me out loud. Outdo one another in showing honor. So you say, Pastor Doug, well, why should I do that for my spouse? My spouse doesn't honor me like that. Well, guess what? Good for you. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't have any trouble outdoing them then, right? I, I was listening to, and if you know the name, the, 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 her name is Amy, Amy Grishel. Uh, she's the pastor's, uh, she's the wife of Craig Grishel. And, I, and I, heard, I heard she was talking about this testimony of how they were actually, they were actually talking to a, a lady doing some counseling with she and, she and Pastor Craig together. And, and, and this lady spent about 15, 20, 30 minutes talking trash about her husband, everything that's wrong with him, everything that he's doing wrong, why it's all his fault, uh, and all this stuff is coming out. And by the way, it might have been true, you know, but that wasn't the point. And finally, after about 20, 30 minutes of him just trash talking her husband, Amy spoke up and said, you know, I've heard, I've heard, I've got it. I've got the picture. I, that, that's pretty much enough. Why don't you do this? Instead of trashing him, the man that you're married to, why don't you, why don't you start getting into the habit of building him up and honoring him? To which she jumped back and said, well, it's easy for you to say, I would honor my husband if my husband was one-tenth the man that your husband is. To which Amy responded back, well, maybe my husband is the man that he is because I've spent our entire marriage honoring him, right? Get into the habit of outdoing one another, and it could be anything. I mean, it's simple things, you know, just, just maybe take someone out to lunch and then pay for it, you know, if you got the means to do it, just pay for it. I had a friend uh, who, uh, we have a friend that, uh, it's, it's been a little while, but it, it, we'd have to actually fight for that check, you know what I'm saying? We'd get into a restaurant, and, and I would have to... Uh, it got to a point where it was so ridiculous. Every time I go to get the check, it was already paid for. And so I would have to find creative ways to, to pay for the check. I'd actually excuse myself halfway through the lunch, 
go find my server, pretend like I was using the restroom, go find my server and say, here, here's my credit card, pay for it. You know, here it is. And then I, and I get back to the table and, aha, I got you on this one. And then the following time we go out and I, I do the same thing, excuse myself from the table, go over there, find my server and say, here's my credit card, pay for it. And, and she'd be like, well, I, he, he already paid for it. Oh, how did he do that? He snuck past me. I didn't even see that, right? So, so then, you know, I had to, you had to get creative, you know. In the middle of the, middle of the, of the, of the meal, it wasn't good enough. When you, when you first got there, before you even got seated, you had to walk him and go, here it is. Just put it on this, whatever we choose, right? Well, the next time... He called it in ahead of time. I had to do whatever I had to do. I, I, so I ended up buying the restaurant. I mean, then whatever, whatever you got to do, just, just, just find creative ways, outdo each other, and showing honor. Why? Because the more I value something, the more value I get from it. Uh, you guys, and I'm going to close with this, but you guys, um, you guys know the story of Babe Ruth, right? Babe Ruth is an all-time legend baseball player. In fact, I think I got his picture up here on the, on the screen there. That's him. That's the Babe the Sultan of Swat, right? That's him, Babe Ruth, legend, the man, the legend, the baseball player. Literally, literally changed the entire face in the game of baseball in his, in his generation. It was amazing. Uh, he was known for home runs, even though he doesn't technically hold the home run record. He, just, he was just that, that charismatic ball player that changed the game of baseball. The great Bambino, Babe Ruth. If you were to Google search the greatest baseball player who ever lived. Just try it sometime, not now, preaching here. But if you were to Google the greatest baseball player that ever lived, immediately this list would come up. And, uh, and, and ahead of the names like Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, Ty Cobb, be, be Babe Ruth, number one. Just no matter how you Google it, right? Ba- Babe Ruth, he, he signed in his lifetime Tons of baseballs, like tons of baseballs. But he only signed seven home run bats. Can I have that for a minute? You're going to like this. This is one of them right here. No, I'm just kidding. It's not really one of them. <laughs> that would have been really cool if it was, though, right? <laughs> that would have been awesome. Woo, what could we have done with that, right? But anyway, he signed only seven of them. One of them was lost for many, many years. They didn't know where it was. And uh, a man had it. And finally, in 1988, he was on his deathbed. And he had no living relatives. And he decided to uh, help out a young lady nurse who had been taking care of him. Again, he had no relatives. And uh, on his deathbed, before he died, he, he gave her that signed Babe Ruth bat. Right? She took it. She, she didn't know what she had in her possession. She stuck it under her bed for 18 years. 18 years. She, she retired in 2006 from nursing, and uh, she, uh, she always had a dream to open up her own restaurant. But she didn't have the means to do it. She didn't have the money to do it. And so she thought to herself, I wonder if that bat's worth anything. So she went under, she went under and got that thing out from under the bed and took it to a collector uh, who specializes in baseball memorabilia. Did I say that right? And he saw that and he immediately, he knew exactly what it was by the print on it and the description and the handwriting. He looked at it and he realized this was the missing bat. And he's like, lady, you don't even know what you have here in your possession. She said, what? He, she, he says, this is the missing, this is like the, this is like the answer to the, how the world was created. This is the missing link. You know, this is like the, you know, baseball players. He, anyway, he's like, so with his help and assistance, she took it to auction and it auctioned for almost $1.3 million. Well, she was able to open up a restaurant <laughs> and uh, she had so much money left over that she decided to donate the rest of it to a charity that Babe Ruth had, had given to while he was alive that was still in operation to, to, young, to youths. And I uh, want you to think about that for a minute. Listen. Listen because of the name that was on it. Without that name, it was only worth about 20 bucks and that includes shipping and handling. But because the name was on it, it brought value. She actually said this. I love her statement. Can you give it to me? She said, the bat was only valuable because Babe Ruth's name was on it. 
since he made it valuable, the only reason, the only reasonable thing I could do was something that would honor his life. She gave it to charity. Why do we honor people? Because God's name is on them. They're, they're made in his likeness. Why do I honor you today? Because God's name is on you. You, you say, Pastor Doug, you don't, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what my past is all about. No. No, I don't. But I'm learning how to live a different way. The Spirit of God is teaching me how to live differently. And I'm learning how to see both your value, your, your value and your dignity and your depravity all at the same time. Look into my eyes this morning. I see you. This is your pastor talking. I see you. You're watching online right now. Look, 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 in, look into the TV or the computer screen or whatever you're looking. Just look into my eyes. I see you. And I see the incredible worth that Christ has put down on the inside of you. I see the potential that God has placed on your life. I see the value that you have. And why? Because of what's been written across your life. I want to pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity today, sir, to speak something to the hearts of my brothers, my sisters, people who are watching online. and Maybe there's someone here today or someone watching who feels like they're far away, far removed from any sign of great significance. Maybe, maybe because of their past or who they've been associated with or the things that they've done or thought or the way they've lived. Maybe they felt so far removed. God, you have called us today to live a different way of life, to, to see people both in their depravity and in their dignity, to be more like you, to have a heart that's like you, that, that, that we, 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 can, we can actually learn how to honor and not necessarily even agree. Like you're not calling us to jump in the cage with people, but you are calling us to honor, to, to, to burn a light, to let it come out. You told us, Father, in your word, let our light so shine before men that they would see those good works and come to glorify our heavenly Father which is in heaven. I pray, Father God, that we will learn that way of living. In Jesus' name. If you're here today and you have not received Jesus as your personal Savior, maybe you're watching online and you don't know him today as your Lord and Savior, I just simply want to invite you to know him. It's not like joining the church. We're not asking you to become a member of anything. We're not asking you for an offering or to sign anything. You can do it right here where you're seated. You simply say, Dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm asking you to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Forgive me of my sin. I, I receive Jesus into my heart and life. I'm, I'm asking today that you become the master and the Lord of my life. I submit myself and surrender myself to you in Jesus' name. Listen, we believe you prayed that very simple prayer. You got born again. We want to we wanna, we wanna talk to you. We have something we want to offer you. If you're watching online and you raise your hand, just click on the comment link. Say, Pastor, that was me. I raised my hand today. If you're here today, maybe you, as a point of renewal for the first time, whatever, if, if that's you today, we, we have something we want to give you, get you on your journey. Listen, I love you guys. Appreciate you so very much. Um, we want to we wanna come back next Sunday. Remember, we're going to have a, we're going to celebrate our nation next Sunday, and we have something very special planned, so you want to come on out for that. Hope you got something out of this today. Amen. Remember your assignment. Find ways to outdo one another and, lo and, and honor today. Amen. God bless you. Will you do me one more favor, will you please? Will you turn around and tell two or three people how glad you were to see them in God's house? God bless you. Thank you.